uh, welcome to the 42nd Agnes and Constantine first lecture. This lecture series, regularly held since 1933, was endowed by Ms. Edith Zweibuch to deal with, quote, the immortality of the soul or some kindred spiritual subject. Until the early 60s, it was given mostly by distinguished philosophers or Christian divines, such as Ralph Barton Perry, William Sperry, William Hawking, C.D. Broad, Paul Tillich, as well as a small bevy of bishops. Since then, we have mostly had neurobiologists, historians of science, or mathematicians on the one hand, and orientalists on the other, such as the excellent talk given a year and a half ago by the great Taoist specialist, Christopher Schreppe, on the subject of how to reach immortality without really trying. <laughs> the presence of today's speaker, uh, perhaps the greatest of patristic scholars, and the only one, to my knowledge, equally at home in Eastern and Western Christianity, represents, therefore, a return to ancient tradition, as well as being a very great honor for Berkeley. Professor Chadwick is no stranger to either the United States or to the Bay Area. Indeed, he gives a lie in his own person to the picture of the insular Englishman. Like a good wine, he travels with gusto, perhaps I should say gusto, and he travels well. He has taught or lectured in Chicago, Boston, New York, and in Berkeley at the GTU and at the Newman Club only last year. The same spirit of adventure can be seen even in his academic career. The Chadwick Peregrinationis, from Cambridge to Oxford, from Oxford to Cambridge, and back and forth again, though somewhat hard to trace, have in fact become something of a legend. Beginning his career as a fellow of Magdalen College, I think I pronounced it correctly, Cambridge, he then transferred to the other place, where he became dean of Christ Church, Oxford, and religious professor of divinity. In 1979, I hope I got the date right, he transferred back to Cambridge and became Regis Professor of Divinity there, uh, the only person uh, ever in history to have held both Regis Professorships. He has recently been emeritus, if you'll pardon the academic drama from that last post, and though retired at Oxford, uh, uh, has just now become master-elect of Peterhouse in Cambridge. For the undergraduates in this audience, his most familiar work is probably his wonderful and deceptively simple first volume in the Pelican History of the Church, undoubtedly the best introduction to church history available today. To others, he has become famous as the authority on Alexandrian Christianity through the volume that bears his title in the Library of Christian Classics series, and through his translation of, in many ways, really a new edition, an introduction to Origins Against Celsus. In the last decade or so, he has moved west in spirit, as well in his more earthly travels. I suppose Cambridge, Oxford is back west, and California is even further west. Um, and has written a book on that mysterious figure, Priscillian of Avila, another particularly attractive one on Boetius, and most recently has been writing on St. Augustine, a topic which, having left California, he will pursue at the Sewanee Conference in the wilds of Tennessee. If I may be permitted to end on a slightly more personal note, I have met Professor Chadwick all too rarely. The few times I have done so have confirmed his fama publica. Not only is he enormously learned, both exceedingly quick and exceedingly subtle, a very entertaining speaker, he's also a very kind and generous person. Welcome, therefore, Professor Chadwick to Berkeley, and may you often return. Professor Kaspari, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I should like to begin by expressing my most cordial thanks to the Chancellor and to the Foster Lectureship Committee, uh, chaired by Professor Stahl, for this very high honor of being invited to come to Berkeley, to the University of California, to lecture on immortality. Um, I suppose I'm getting to an age where it's a subject I shall know more about soon. Uh, I am by trade a historian, and especially a historian of the debates generated by the interaction, the continuity and discontinuity, between early Christianity and its pagan environment. <clears throat> 
As I look down this uh, list of my predecessors, I confess that I am overwhelmed. Um, what a wonderful party it would be if we got them all together in the same room at the same time, but I'm afraid some of them are no longer alive. Um, as for coming west, then that's a lovely thing to do. There is an early Christian writer, well, he was 7th century, named Cosmas Indicoplustes, who was a sort of uh, uh, Nestorian merchant who traveled to South India, and he lets loose the blissfully happy observation that from reading Genesis, he is, of course, quite certain that paradise is located in the east. Nevertheless, he adds, westward migration is the order of providence. <laughs> now, the Foster Lectureship, as you know, was established by Edith Zweibruck as a memorial to Agnes and Constantine Foster. And the terms of her benefaction indicate that she wanted her lecturers to range fairly widely. And uh, I nevertheless propose to talk on the primarily assigned subject. And I hope that I have correctly interpreted the benefactor's wishes in inviting your attention to certain aspects of the way in which immortality was handled in the interaction between the Christians and the educated pagans, most of whom were adherents of the Platonic tradition in philosophy. Now, Christianity is one thing, Platonism is another. And yet, as one surveys the history of Western thought, uh, the interaction between the two uh, meets one at almost every stage of the story. Now, the earliest surviving tract in commenting and criticizing uh, uh, Christianity was, in fact, composed by a Platonist of the second century, and he didn't like Christianity at all for Platonic reasons. Nevertheless, the marriage of Christian theology with Platonic metaphysics can be seen to be going very strong indeed in the main Christian thinkers of the Greek churches in the second, third, and fourth centuries of the Christian era. And in a little book written over 20 years ago on early Christian thought and the classical tradition, now regarded what is to any professor that supreme accolade of getting into paperback rather than cloth binding, I tried to trace the early stages of that marriage in three men, Justin, Clement, and Origen. Towards Platonism, Justin, about 150, is sunnily optimistic. You feel he would have been delighted to have all the Platonists he could find to lunch on the same day. Clement of Alexandria, yes, he would have been gone. He would have accepted an invitation to dinner with his platonic friends, but he would have been a little careful what the conversation was about while he was there, and on the whole was rather more reserved towards Platonism. And his successor at Alexandria, the very intelligent man, Origen, is quite frankly coldly hostile. Anything less like a third century Erasmus would be hard to find. And often people with somewhat Erasmian uh, ideals of Christian classical humanism have said, I like reading Origen. I will sit down and read the Contra Selsum, and they are outraged. They put it down in anger and say, how could he be so rude? to this uh, uh, very intelligent tradition of philosophy. And yet, uh, that's not the end of the story, that's not the end of the paradox, because the degree to which each of those three men was impregnated with platonic ideas was in fact in inverse proportion to the enthusiasm with which they talk about it. Origen is much more profoundly platonic than the other two. Clement had got Platonism in his bloodstream, whether he liked it or not. 
And of the three, the man who is so optimistic about a marriage of Christianity and Platonism, namely Justin, is the man on the whole of those three least well informed on the subject. Orthodox bishops of the third century held Origen in a certain suspicion. Um, in 1941, the uh, British army in uh, uh, Egypt had some caves cleared of rubbish south of Cairo in order to make a cache for ammunition, and it led to the discovery of an ancient rubbish dump containing priceless papyri, including the papyrus record of the minutes of a discussion in which Origen took part with some bishops and expounded to them the doctrine of the soul. And at a very high climax in the point, uh, in the course of this discussion, Origen has made a great speech, and then the presiding bishop said, Origen teaches Plato's doctrine of the soul. And it was quite clear that the words were an indictment. He was expected to answer a charge. In the fourth century, we do meet one theologian, he was the bishop of the city of Ankara, who deliberately rejected the tradition of Origen. He, in the 330s, he tried what we might now call a back to the Bible movement, uh, and was very offensive about the extent to which Origen and his tradition had brought Platonism into the church. And throughout the age of the Church Fathers, there is a kind of um, a marriage with tiffs, a love-hate relationship. Um, the Cappadocian trio, Basil of Caesarea, his brother Gregory of Nyssa, his friend Gregory of Nazianzus, they were all deeply at home with Plato and with the third century Neoplatonist Plotinus, whom they had read with great care and uh, who did a lot for them by his writings. And 120 years after their time, the man who, a very intelligent man, who wrote in the name of St. Paul's convert Dionysius the Areopagite, incorporated in his Christian mystical scheme parts of the language and even bits of the thought of Proclus, head of the Athens Academy, a Neoplatonist of passionately anti-Christian opinions who thought Christianity was an intellectual black death that he didn't quite know how anybody was going to survive. Uh, the Dionysius the Areopagite's forgeries were brilliantly successful. They were, if I may say so, the sixth century equivalent of Piltdown Man. In other words, he offered his readers something they wanted and about 10% more of it than they expected, and that is a perfect uh, recipe for success. In Latin translation, his works passed to the medieval West. Nobody except Fouchius in the ninth century seems to have paid very much attention to a skeptical Greek critique of the authenticity of this man's writings written by a discerning man of the seventh century who observed that the rites and ceremonies described in Dionysius' account of the liturgy were developed long after the apostles' time and the work couldn't possibly be genuine. But uh, nobody took any notice because they didn't wish to believe it. Now, I shall not try to trace the history of Christian Platonism right through, through the Renaissance, its influence in the Reformation on Swingley, which is quite marked, on Cambridge theologians of the 17th century, on Malebranche, Schleiermacher, one of the things that surprises theologians is the discovery that those who study Plato think that the greatest creator of modern Platonic studies was a man called Schleiermacher, and I have noticed that classical scholars are sometimes amazed to discover that the founder of modern theology was the same man. But a lecture should not become a catalogue of names. Let me simply observe that there was a massive degree to which Christians and Platonists in antiquity and since made common cause despite certain abrasions. Now, in part in the West, that was a legacy of one man above all others, and that was Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in North, uh, that's in uh, eastern Algeria, Anaba today. 
Uh, Plato's language about the immortality of the soul, about the soul's ladder of ascent from action to contemplation, from multiplicity to an inner unity, his language about the capacity of the purified soul once liberated from the prison of the body to rise to the vision of God in a mystical ecstasy which could be described in part in the language of arrows that invested his philosophy for ancient men with the dignity of a kind of religion. Um, Augustine was rather rude about the fact that they uh, spoke about Plato in such uh, religious language and once ironically adds, I do not know of any temples dedicated to this philosopher. Platonism was for many in antiquity, in fact, an alternative to Christianity, an opponent rather than a supportive partner. And yet in the third, fourth and fifth centuries of our era, the impact of Christianity on the Platonists themselves was steadily mounting. Uh, Plotinus biographer and editor, Porphyry, late third century, hated Christianity, but he dissociated himself from the view of Plato and his master Plotinus that reincarnation can be, at least for some, a return to animal rather than human bodies. And Augustine thought that at that point, Porphyry may well have been sensitive to Christian criticism on just that point. In the City of God, there are three occasions where he says that he thinks Porphyry was in fact having, so to speak, a Christian nudging him in the ribs on that subject. In the fourth century, I think we can say that between Christianity and Platonism, there was a steady juxtaposition gradually becoming a rapprochement. You may see this in artistic representation if you follow Professor David Wright's suggestion that the catacomb in the Via Latina in Rome, which has some mainly uh, Christian uh, chambers with mainly Christian paintings, but has also got some neutral or philosophical or indeed um, pagan representations too. Nothing I think that a Christian could not have interpreted with a little bit of goodwill. But that Via Latina catacomb was a burial ground belonging to a family with divided allegiance, some being Christians and some not. Um, uh, it's uh, a most attractive hypothesis. And there is one trenchant sentence in one of Augustine's letters. The Platonists of my time have divided into two groups. Some of them have become Christians, and the rest have gone over to magic and the occult. It was, I think, a judgment which could be described as more unkind than untrue. The Platonists offered philosophical objections to important elements in the Christian story. It is of great interest, I think, that in Origen and in Augustine, the objections are answered not by appeals to authority so much as by philosophical arguments. In the 12th book of the City of God, Augustine enjoyed himself enormously uh, as a philosopher uh, because he was there meeting some of the most formidable of the Platonist critiques of the Christian scheme and he met them on their own ground and there's an element of triumph as he puts his pen down at the end of the book absolutely certain that purely on grounds of philosophical logic he has made mincemeat of them. He enjoyed himself, as I say. The Platonists thought that the concept of redemption implied that God was doing something new. Was that compatible with divine immutability? And Augustine replied that the notion of creation, which the Platonists conceded if they took the Timaeus of Plato seriously, was just as difficult. The fallacy, and there was a fallacy in the argument, lay in thinking, he said, that God has to change his will in order to will a change. Not even human beings have to do that. To those who asked why the incarnation had come along so late in the day, Augustine, I think, acutely replied that if you put the event earlier by a finite number of years, from a philosopher's point of view, 
the question is totally unchanged. And if you say that it was an infinite period of time earlier, then Augustine folds his arms with a bland smile and says, I should be very interested to know what on earth those words mean. The sharpest disagreements lay in the estimate of soul and body. To the Platonists, the soul possesses an inherent immortality. It only needs to be released from the body to achieve its, few, its true destiny. And Porphyry repeatedly said, everything physical is to be uh, eschewed, run away from, omne corpus fugiendum. It was a cliche for him. Now, to the Christians, the soul is contingent, created, created, said Augustine repeatedly, out of nothing. And that is why, he said, it is liable to false choices. What about the body? Well, the Christians were not as quite as enthusiastic about the body as they were about the soul, as you might expect. And some Christians spoke negatively on the subject. But contrary to common report and reputation, Augustine is found making very many positive affirmations about the beauty, utility, and essential goodness of the human body as something that God has made, and so also of the whole physical cosmos. If there is a fault, I quote, it lies in the morbid condition of the mind. That's where the trouble lies, not in the body. These questions about soul and body became focused round immortality, and especially round one issue of Platonic reincarnation belief versus Christian resurrection belief. Now, the language of immortality is, in fact, I submit, ambivalent. It could be used to support either interpretation of human destiny without a very great deal of massage on the words. The ambiguity goes far back beyond Augustine, Origen, Clement, or and Justin. It goes back, actually, into the New Testament itself. I propose to stop briefly on this point in order to demonstrate it to you. The two Corinthian letters in the Pauline corpus of the New Testament both contain very substantial passages about the life of the world to come in 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. And the former of these passages is undoubtedly one of the noblest statements on the subject one could find. In fact, I can remember coming away from a funeral and somebody saying to me after that lecture had been read, it's well worth dying to have that read over you. <laughs> now, the relationship between the two passages has from time to time been a matter of some learned debate and even dispute. And the debate is in part dependent on a lot of uncertainties because one has to have a hypothetical reconstruction of the situation at Corinth being addressed in the two letters. Uh, any reconstruction has to uh, contain some elements of plausible guesswork. But we can't avoid that if we're going to interpret the letters at all. And my point can be simply illustrated in passing by the observation that uh, if one is going to find a correct interpretation of the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians on marriage and celibacy, it's of cardinal significance to decide whether that chapter is recommending asceticism to a church which has been celebrating too many weddings, or whether, as I would think vastly more probable, the apostle is actually combating a rigorist absolutism which regards sexuality as the most dangerous invention probably of diabolical origin, and which was asserting that it was something that every truly pneumatic Christian would rise above. Now, the apostles' characteristic method of approach was to concede, in principle, very much to the absolutists and next to nothing in practice. I say, in principle, I think it would be rather more correct to use the French phrase, en principe, a, a, a phrase which in the French language means the opposite of our English formula in principle. When 
Anglo-Saxon speakers agree to something in principle, they are agreeing that something ought to be done, that sooner or later, and probably sooner, it will be done. There may be some small print to draft, some practical details to tidy up, but these are derivative, they are of the accidents rather than the substance of the matter, and there is a consensus on the essential points, and uh, no difficulties are really expected, and it's going to happen. When the French say, en principe, we agree, what they mean is that in the abstract, it's a highly desirable idea, but the earthy actualities and practicalities of the situation are such that, in fact, it's out of the question and nobody's going to lift a finger because we are sensible people and nobody is going to waste their time on what everybody knows to be impossible. I uh, had a friend once in the British Foreign Office who reached an agreement with the Quai d'Orsay, the French Foreign Office, in principle, and he did not, was unaware of the fact that in French it had the opposite sense to the one he thought he had persuaded his French colleagues to agree to. That was a hell of a row. <laughs> the form of the Apostles' assent, there is an en principe assent. He agrees to the ascetics at Corinth that they, uh, he is assenting that we may reduce a matter of precept to the level of counsel. He wants to say that the individual is free to make a choice. He will allow that ascetic renunciation is appropriate. And latent, between, latent under the surface of the text of 1 Corinthians 7, there lie two very ancient motifs, well attested in the pre-Christian world, and those two motifs declare that those who have enjoyed the love of a divine being must forego the love of mortals, and that the act of conjugal intercourse in any circumstances involves some element of pollution, some presence of uh, malevolent, unfriendly spirits. Those are two very ancient pre-Christian ideas. The illusion that before the church came along uh, to make people feel guilty on the subject, the ancient world was a sort of like, a bit rather like Gauguin's dreams about Tahiti, is not an illusion I propose to waste time in refuting here. Before such an audience, it's not necessary. Now, the apostle concedes to the Corinthians that while both partners in marriage have equal conjugal rights, nevertheless, concentration at times of special contemplation at prayer would suggest abstinence. Moreover, the married person wants to please the spouse. The unattached person can concentrate, he says, on serving and pleasing the Lord. Now, from that language, it's no great distance to adapting the platonic analogy of love to illuminate the nature of the soul's aspiration after the vision of God, which you get in the Platonic Symposium and Phaedrus. In the second century, the Valentinian Gnostics especially liked the theme of the soul as mystic bride of the divinely elect partner. In the Epistle to the Ephesians, there is an explicit bridal mysticism. The bride is the church rather than the individual soul, and that's an evident extension of an Old Testament theme of God's people as the bride of Yahweh. Now, Ephesians chapter 5 was found deeply congenial in the Gnostic school of Valentine, which interpreted it within a semi-Platonic mystical framework. The elect soul is admitted to the vision of celestial beauty and united with the divine to which the soul has an innate affinity. Now, Platonists loved that sort of language. The Phaedrus had spoken of this vision as an ecstasy in which the soul is carried beyond the deliverances of the natural reason. Now, in the pages of both Old and New Testaments, bridal symbolism is frequent. Uh, with a few exceptions, modern writers become extraordinarily coy on this subject, but the text is there writ large. You just have to read it. It would be misleading to suggest that the roots of this theme in the history of Christian thought are an intrusion into uh, uh, something that uh, doesn't stem from these biblical roots. <laughs> 
The Christian tradition was therefore easily able to fuse together biblical and platonic terminology on this bridal mysticism theme. If you read the Confessions of St. Augustine, you find him addressing his maker in language which at first sight is a little bit puzzling. We should understand the Confessions a lot better if we had rather more of the sort of Latin in which young men of 370 addressed their best girl. It is that sort of language, and whether you find it embarrassing or sublime is a matter of choice which I leave to you to decide. Um, I remember once being severely rebuked by somebody uh, who thought that it was much more sublime than embarrassing. Uh, seven centuries later, you can read the homilies on the Song of Songs by Bernard of Clairvaux, certainly one of the greatest books of medieval times. And you'll find there that the whole uh, bride-bridegroom mysticism is uh, using language which had been domesticated within the early patristic tradition in this fusion of the Bible and Platonism. And uh, in the apostle himself, in 1 Corinthians 13, in the hymn to charity, you have uh, the presence of related themes. Faith and hope, he says, belong to this realm of transient existence, but love has the power to carry right through into the life of the world to come. Love presupposes a relationship with God which is of abiding permanence. And to accept the love of God into the soul is to believe that this soul is thereby given a divine and eternal dimension. And it is rooted, says the apostle, in a knowing of God now only in part, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. An enigmatic. Some of the Apostle's language is anticipated in his elder contemporary, also a Greek-speaking Jew, Philo of Alexandria. For Philo more than once says, I quote, we see God as if through a reflecting mirror. And Philo anticipates the Apostle's passionate aspiration where the Apostle says that I may know even as also I am known. I quote from Philo, the mind draws near to the one by whom it has been drawn. Or again, the vision of God is both seeing and being seen. Now this metaphor of the mirror with its suggestion of passivity in contemplation recurs in the second epistle to the Corinthians just before the passage about the life of the world to come. Immediately before that, you get these words. We all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord as if reflected in a mirror and are transformed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord the Spirit. In other words, in this life, there can be no direct vision, only indirect, but the seeing of God is mediated, as he says a few lines later, through Jesus. Now, this language about image, mirror, transformation, it's a very striking language. Can we find parallels to it in ancient literature? Were such terms current coin? Well, the answer is yes. Reflecting God as in a mirror is a turn of phrase found in a collection of Neo-Pythagorean maxims preserved in the third century Platonist Porphyry, whom I've already mentioned. Uh, in his old age, Porphyry uh, uh, decided that his earlier tracts in praise of celibacy had been a mistake, and he got married to an elderly Jewish lady named Marcella, and thereby gave a lot of ammunition to his critics. And uh, having married her, he then promptly went off on a long journey, and in order to console the lady during his absence, he compiled a fascinating uh, collection of moral maxims on the moral and spiritual life, of which that is one. You are to reflect God as in a mirror. Uh, the same kind of language can be found in Philo. Um, Philo uh, says, we are not to seek a reflection of God's being in anything other than himself. For created things are transitory 
uncreated, eternal. Now, that is virtually word for word identical with the last verse, last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where the apostle says, visible things are transient, invisible things are eternal. Now, Paul's contrast between this world and the world to come could then be re-expressed in language familiar to Platonism. The apostle's language about transformation is also striking, metamorphosis. A famous passage of the seventh book of Plato's Republic talks about the moral life as being based on insight resulting from a radical inner conversion of the soul. And the Stoic Seneca says that the mind, I quote, needs not only correction of life, it needs to be transformed inside. Transfigurari, very strong language, it occurs twice. In Romans 12, the apostle also speaks of the mind experiencing a reshaping, a renewal, a transfiguration. Now, in the second epistle to the Corinthians, the body's uh, humble condition is part of that from which the power of God can deliver us. The outward man is perishing. The daily renewal is of the soul within the inward man. That is why the apostle can disregard uh, the troubles afflicting him. He goes on to speak of the body as a tent, a temporary shelter to be replaced by a permanent structure, a house not made with earthly hands, eternal in the heavens. And then the metaphor suddenly changes from tent and building to that of nakedness and clothing. Will the soul, having lost its shelter or vehicle by physical death, be found defenseless, naked, without protection? The image of nakedness is in the Platonic tradition. It occurs in the Cratylus of Plato, 403, where he says that the nakedness of the soul in the kingdom of, of the dead is what scares people about death. In these chapters of 2 Corinthians, there is a succession then of parallel contrasts, transient, permanent, temporal, eternal, Old Testament, New Testament, Moses, Christ, this world, the next, body and soul. And the way in which these antitheses are put together is partly using biblical language, but also echoing the language of the non-Semitic world, the Platonists and the Neopythagoreans and Philo, who was at home in that world himself. What is the relation then between 1 and 2 Corinthians? Well, in a book published nearly half a century ago, Wilfred Knox of Cambridge uh, urged that the relation of the two epistles was one of the strongest possible antithesis. His thesis, which I express in a much more crude form than he put it in his highly sophisticated book, 1939, uh, is that uh, two Corinthians is saying to the Corinthian church, I am so sorry you didn't like the funeral service in my last letter, here's a new one. Now, we are accustomed to working with the contrast between the late Jewish, early Christian hope of resurrection, the Platonic belief in immortality. There's no doubt at all that the biblical language about resurrection was found to be very difficult to Hellenized minds in the Roman world. It was a bone in the throat not only of pagans, it was also found very difficult by those who wanted to be good Orthodox Catholic Christians. In one of Augustine's writings, uh, he develops a, a, a kind of ladder of ascent of the soul. And when you're quite high up on the ladder, he says, when you've got to that degree of maturity, you no longer have any doubts about resurrection. Quite a significant uh, sentence, you see. As though at the earlier stages it was more difficult. Now, the controversy of antiquity has left us with the impression that there was a black and white contrast. I think it relatively easy to show that 1 and 2 Corinthians were not, in fact, contradictory. They were using this ambivalent language of immortality in either the one sense or the other, and that you could move from one sphere to the other without great difficulty. 
The Platonists of the Roman period interpreted the Timaeus of Plato to mean that the disembodied soul after death has what they called a, a vehicle, an ochima, enabling transition and progress. It's not the naked soul of which the Cratylus had spoken. For modern scholars, the old-fashioned antithesis between the Greek view of immortality and the biblical worldview has been undergoing a lot of shifts anyway. What our grandfathers loved to label biblical, we know today to be just part of a general diffuse Semitic way of talking, not something that always has to be dignified with the humble awe appropriate to divine revelation. On the other side, the Greek element in the New Testament background, which is strong, is certainly not just anything and everything that any Greek of any time may have felt or thought. It is an identifiable uh, body of talking, a blend of popular stoic morality set in a loose framework of Platonic metaphysics, which was widely current in the first Christian century. People got very tired of the wrangles between different philosophical schools into which more than a touch of rancor could enter. They found life far too short to study them all and to decide which they were going to opt for, and therefore they were rather attracted by an eclecticism, declaring that in all the great Greek philosophical schools there was some element of truth and one could hold them all together if one were properly selective even large parts of the morality of Epicurus. There's one very fascinating sentence in the Confessions of Augustine, where he says that if only he had not denied the immortality of the soul, I would have thought that Epicurus' hedonist account of human behavior as being motivated by the desire for pleasure or the avoidance of pain was quite right. Very remarkable sentence in Augustine. So that you could even fit in the Epicurean morality if you tried. Now, in the mission of the church pushing into the Gentile world, it was obviously easier if you spoke of immortality rather than of resurrection. But in point of fact, they tended to bring the two together. The Renaissance had an enormous debt to the Neoplatonists, and in fact that was anticipated by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century with his commentary on parts of Proclus and a good deal of the uh, first part of the Summa Theologica of Aquinas is uh, unintelligible unless one's read a good deal of Proclus to start with. Immortality of the soul was a truth of natural religion to the deists from Lord Herbert of Cherbury onwards, and the Christian heaven was not. And that was largely because they knew that the ancient Greek philosophers had thought that there were sufficient philosophical arguments for believing in it, and they didn't need to argue the point all over again. The hope of the life of the world to come could be expressed by ancient and medieval Christians in ways that could accommodate the Platonic tradition. And one way of doing that was to think of the soul as being in the waiting state between death and judgment and undergoing progressive sanctification to prepare for the final judgment and the glory for which souls are hardly fit at the time of the body's dissolution. Of course, the Christians safeguarded their position by saying that that was granted only to those who were built on the correct foundation and who knew that purification was the gift of Christ's grace. If the intercessions of the faithful help now, there can be no good reason for thinking them irrelevant or useless for the departed. Now, within that kind of framework, you could also interpret the discipline of the erring or delinquent as therapeutic. And that meant that the Gorgias of Plato, the most fascinating and most modern of all his dialogues, could contribute very considerably to the way in which the Christians thought about divine purification and discipline. The Gorgias, I say, is modern because 
the grand question that the dialogue faces is how do you keep democracy intact if your traditional moral, moral values are collapsing all around you and propaganda is omnipotent? Everything, I think, to make us feel at home. Yes. Um, that is the question. But the dialogue also contains a very considerable discussion of the theory of punishment and the doctrine that it ought to be remedial and therapeutic. I must hasten to my end. 20th century people are unlike ancient and Renaissance or even deist 18th century men and women. We don't find immortality of the soul actually easier to understand than resurrection, and the ancients did find it easier. Modern Western culture isn't Amelia, in which it's very easy to commend Plato's animistic arguments for immortality from a series of ghost stories. Thoughtful people have never seen immortality as a matter of the self-preservation instinct operating, persuading us that nobody quite as splendid as ourselves could possibly become extinct, and in the life of the world to come, everything will please be as little as different from this one as possible. And what spiritualistic seances say to religious people is normally zero. Nor do sensitive and thoughtful people think that the prime function of the next world will be to administer kicks to the wicked and idle rich and to hand out compensation to the poor and oppressed and underprivileged. Surely that way of thinking is not going to be much appreciated by the poor and oppressed and underprivileged. We can't represent the life of the world to come except in terms of time and space of our present experience. Unending duration, or a special place called heaven, conflicts with the notion that the divine realm transcends all space and time. And somehow we don't seem to get any further towards alleviating our intellectual problems by thinking about a platonic eternal present experienced now in and through the successiveness of our lives. Paradoxically, I submit, the concept of redemption and future judgment has a much richer moral dimension to it than that. And paradoxically, the notion of resurrection about which ancient pagans were often so ruled implies an altogether more positive evaluation of the created and physical order of things and of the momentousness of our life now. Our difficulty can be encapsulated into a sentence. We all live in history, and history is a story. Belief in the life of the world to come, immortality, has an extraordinary way of giving history a point. It imparts momentous value to our life in this world, intense solemnity and responsibility to the transitory moment. I must sum up. Christianity and Platonism achieved in late antiquity an unexpected and strange marriage relationship, a marriage marked by a great number of tiffs in which a lot of China got thrown about but mostly centered on the relation of God to the material world. The Christian way of thinking and speaking about that as exemplified in the Incarnation or their language about the life to come, that caused distress to the Platonic philosophers. In return, the Christians didn't think that Platonic ideas of ghostly survival had religious value, and they were almost uniformly very critical of Plato and his doctrine of reincarnation. But if we ask, who was it who really laid the foundations for the marriage? Who was the matchmaker which brought them together? I think the answer is perfectly clear that it was the Apostle Paul. Thank you very much.